Sarah's father, Brian, 
and Sarah's mother Rosie uh, in your prayers. And so with concerns far away and near at home, let's uh, open our hearts and lives and bring all these concerns to our loving Lord Jesus as we say the prayer at the top of page two. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now our time of confession. In a moment of stillness, let's recall those things for which we seek God's forgiveness. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. We pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We start to sing the Gloria. the Sunday next before Lent. Holy God, you know the disorder of our sinful lives. Set straight our crooked hearts and bend our wills to love your goodness and your glory. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Do you please be seated for our first Bible reading. The reading is from Exodus. Verse 34, chapter 24, 34, verses 29 to the end. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. 
As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face, but whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin on his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. So hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus took with him Peter, John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And the disciples kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Well, thank you, Mark. words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. One of the 20th century mountaintop experiences we know about was Edmund Hillary making it to the top of Everest with Sherpa Tensing in 1953. And I guess some of us here will probably remember that. Um, certainly it was a life-changing experience for Hillary. But his personal transformation was at least partly about the way that experience taught him to see the Sherpa people in different ways. From that point, he became dedicated to building schools and hospitals in the poor and making sure that the trust he set up made a difference for those mountain people. On a more personal note and significantly less noteworthy, um, we had part of our family, our daughter and two, grand, uh, daughter and two granddaughters, uh, over from Norfolk to stay last year. Um, and we took them to see our son who lives on the Welsh border. Now on the way there was a sudden flurry of interest. We come in sight of the Mulvans. Uh, the girls thought this was something spectacular. Look, 
Mountains. Well, okay. If you come from Norfolk, anything like that is a mountain. Uh, and, and bear in mind that, as you probably know, Norfolk is as flat as the proverbial pancake. But there does seem to be something about mountains or hills, in the case of the Morvans, um, that, that's different, that's special. Now, the mountaintop experience that Luke recounts in his Gospel reminds us that if we're to follow the path of Christ, we need to first allow ourselves to be transformed. And then we need to get out into the chaos and the disorder of the world and work for the healing of our world. The mountaintop is a wonderful place to gain a sense of perspective that is probably not the place to live. Jesus needed periods of meditation and the occasional mountaintop experience in his own life, and so do we. But Jesus' work was with the people who needed him most, to be a voice for the voiceless, a healer of the hurting, and a challenge to the hypocrites. They were certainly the tasks to which he returned with his disciples when he came down from the mountain. What I most love about the Transfiguration story is that in the midst of all the, the, the glowing radiance of God's presence, we still have the very human disciples. We don't know what James and John thought, but our good old Peter started babbling away about putting up shelters. And, and Peter's sort of inappropriate babbling should also make us wonder what we might do in similar circumstances. Would we offer the transfigured Jesus a cup of tea? Or perhaps ask Moses if he's going anywhere nice for his holidays? Are we prepared to drop our defences and really meet God at the level we need to be met? Let's not assume that seeking such a transfiguration is an easy exercise. The Gospel episode actually raised more questions to the disciples than the answers that they would have preferred. They were confused. This was not a moment of certainty. The passage is meant to unsettle and to challenge certainty. Sometimes we can feel that being faithful is about trying to believe a bit more those things which we find difficult, trying to bolt the questions and the doubts down in a place where they won't disturb us. That's precisely the sort of religion which Stephen Hawking cannot be part of. Neither should we be following such a religion. The Christian calling lies elsewhere in confronting the questions which disturb us, which stir us up, which leave us speechless with incredulity or incomprehension. And it's through our being stretched and challenged that we grow in faith. Now, as Lent looms large, here's an invitation to show a little honesty in our walk with God. Such honesty will lead us to transformation and transfiguration, not mostly in a spectacular and miraculous way, but its effect on others might be long-lasting. Now, more than seven decades ago, an incident took place that changed the course of human history. A small black boy had gone to work in a Johannesburg hospital with his desperately poor and in many ways unloved mother. The mother worked in a hospital as a cleaner, who was very much a second-class citizen. The boy had felt a great sorrow for his mother's state and real anger at a system that institutionalised prejudice and injustice. Just then, a tall man wearing clerical clothes approached his mother, smiled, asked how she was, and took off his hat. 
The man was called Trevor Huddleston, and he was white, English, and a priest who'd gone to work in South Africa because he was appalled at the injustice of apartheid. The young boy, Desmond Tutu, had never seen a white man talk to, let alone smile, at his mother before. From that moment, the boy decided to find out about God, this God that Trevor Huddleston represented, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, is it too much um, a stretch to suggest that Trevor Huddleston was a transfigured figure, the physical embodiment of the Christian faith? He did indeed illuminate the world for the young Desmond Tutu. He didn't do anything dramatic. It's just that he'd been transformed from within and his faith allowed him to see the world and its people through God's eyes. As we start on our journey into Lent, we too should ask God to transform us from within and then to illuminate and transfigure us so that we too can point people towards a better way. As we grow in holiness, we become the sort of people who can bring real and lasting healing. We don't need to become superheroes, but just ordinary, transfigured Christians. The last word on the mountain of transfiguration goes to God, who says to Peter and the other disciples, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Lent begins on Wednesday. It's a good time to seek more of God as we follow Christ on his journey to the cross and beyond. So what might we do to experience God in a new way? Perhaps we could get to grips with the Bible, reading some of the parts we don't know so well, revisiting some of our favourite passages and reading them in a new translation. Perhaps we could spend time reading a religious book, a Lent book, or meeting in a home group. I'll repeat that bit. Or meeting in a home group or Lent group. We could learn to pray more regularly or in a new way. Changing our pattern of prayer can have remarkable results as we meet God in a new and surprising way. Why not start a journal noting every time you're aware of God at work or recording your experiences of God's grace each day? That can be very illuminating and humbling. Wherever we meet God, we are changed. And like Moses, we may not notice any difference, but others will and do. We should be able to see it in one another, glimpses of the glory of God shining out from each other. Moses was being changed. Peter was being changed. And we are being changed. So this Lent, let Jesus meet you in a new way or a new place. Let Jesus surprise you and others as he reveals more of God to you, calls you deeper into himself and changes you more and more into the person you are called to be as you grow into his likeness. In Lent, the church invites us to listen and take stock, to take a penetrating look at our own motivation, our thoughts and our actions, to confront ourselves with the reality of who we are and what might need changing, to open ourselves to the possibility that both the mountain top of the transfiguration we mark today and the Lenten wilderness period which begins on Ash Wednesday may lead us 
towards transformation as well. Let us pray. Lord God, you invite us deeper into your world, your people, your Lent. May this time be one of outward focus, seeking you in those we often ignore. Help us live a Lent focused on freedom, generosity, an encounter of you in new ways as your Spirit leads us. Amen. to stand and renew our faith and trust in our transforming God. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God, the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, as war returns to Europe once more and the world order threatens to shift again, we ask your protection on the people of Ukraine, surrounded and living in fear. We pray for their armed forces and volunteers determined to defend their homeland and all they hold dear. And also for the thousands of refugees fleeing Ukraine to seek safety in neighbouring countries. We remember families in the UK concerned with relatives in Ukraine, including David who has cousins there. We lift you our world leaders faced with terrible decisions on how best to proceed. We pray that your transforming power will turn the hearts and minds of the Russian leadership. Father, we pray that you will bring closer the day when we have peace and reconciliation in the world and end the conflicts that damage the lives of so many. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. Yeah. Almighty God, as we welcome this new day you have given us, we thank you for the peace we enjoy here and for the beauty of the natural world around us. We remember all who have enhanced your creation and enriched our lives by their artistic endeavours, their care of our parks, gardens and open spaces or planning of our environment, particularly here in our town. We pray for all who work hard to meet our daily needs. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. As we approach the season of Lent, may we remember the need to pause, to make time for stillness and quiet to seek a deeper sense of your presence and to be grounded in prayer. We ask your blessing on the Lent groups which will be meeting shortly, praying that they may enrich the faith of those attending. We pray for the congregations of our parish, trying to look forward in hope 
despite the uncertainty that surrounds us, and trusting in your spirit to guide us. We thank you for the fellowship we enjoy in our church, for the fact that you have called us here at this time to be a community of faith, to serve you and grow your presence in our area. We lift to you all who lead and minister to us in this parish. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, your son was born into a family and knew the joys and tensions that family life can bring. Times of laughter and times of sadness. Circumstances to cherish and circumstances to overcome. Times of resilience and times of weakness. Moments to look forward with hope and moments to look back with thanksgiving. We give thanks for our families and ask your blessing on any of our family members who are struggling at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We give thanks for the hospice movement and particularly for the Marie Curie Hospice here in Solihull. We pray for their impatience and for all who are weighed down by any kind of suffering at this time. Among our church members and friends, we remember Angeline, Jane Arnold, Carolyn Stewart, Margaret, and Sarah's father, Brian Haler, who is seriously ill, praying for his wife, Rosie, Sarah, and all the family. And in a moment of quiet, we think of any people in our own lives who are in need of peace and healing. Please bring them your peace in their pain, your strength in their weakness, and your comfort in their sadness. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father, your Son taught us that life is eternal and love cannot die. We commend to your safekeeping John Upton, who has died, and Alice Davis and Sally Derry, whose anniversaries of death fall at this time. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray that the glory of your presence may fill our lives and be reflected in all that we do. Merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand as we prepare to share Christ's peace. Jesus said, Peace I give to you, peace I leave with you. Let not your hearts be troubled and upset. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a gesture of peace. <laughs> We're going to sing now our third hymn, Father we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify your name in all the earth.
you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Lord of all life, you created the universe where all living things reflect your glory. You give us this great and beautiful earth to discover and to cherish. And now we give you thanks because you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Christ. You made us all each wonderfully different to join with the angels and sing your praise. saying, This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After they had eaten, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and shared it with his disciples, saying, This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate his love, his death, his risen life. As you feed us with these gifts, send your Holy Spirit. And change us more and more to be like Jesus, our Saviour. Help us, Father, to love one another as we look forward to that day when suffering is ended and all creation is gathered into your loving arms. Now with Michael, Alphage, and Helen, and all your saints, we give you glory through Jesus Christ in the strength of the Spirit, today and forever. Amen. We sit as we continue in prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, 
because we all share in our merit. together in the prayer on page 14. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. We sit for our notices. Morning, everyone. Morning. And um, we've got some good news. Sunshine. Yeah. Great. Right. Um, I don't know whether you noticed, but um, during the middle of the service, <coughs> Bruce brought his choir. Yes. Did anybody notice? Yes. I yes. hope so. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> right. Um, you already heard about the Lent groups. The sheets are out on the table for you to sign up to those groups. There's two because there's two different sessions. Next week, just a reminder that it's the Helping Hands week for the food donations. And some advance notice. On the 13th of March, there is going to be uh, a walk of witness for racial injustice. This is being organised by the deanery and there are going to be three separate walks, 
all of which will meet up at Acock Screen. Now the one for Solihull starts at Dove House Parade and you go from there down to uh, St Mary's in Acock Green. There will be two stops on the way and at the end there will be refreshments and after that there's a service. So <clears throat> you can either do all the walk, just turn up for the refreshments or turn up for the service or do a mixture, <laughs> up to you. But um, we would like you to sign up if you're going to come on the walk so that they know how to manage numbers, basically. So that's that. Um, as far as Solihull is concerned, it's not just Solihull Parish that will be on the walk from Dove House. There will be people from Knoll and Dorridge, Hampton, Elmden as well. So it should be quite a lot. But of course, car parking is going to be a problem there. So um, perhaps if you can sign up with uh, other people or make some sort of go on the bus even. But that's that. Um, on the 20th of March, we've got our AGM. And <coughs> we do have vacancies on the District Council. And I think it's probably just worth reminding you all of something that is blindingly obvious. And that is, the people are St Michael's, not the building. So if the people don't join in, Nothing happens. I don't leave that with you. There's a new parish news out uh, this week. And um, yes, David, you wanted to say something about Ukraine. Those of you who know me or heard my talk on Holocaust Memorial Day uh, three years ago. Uh, know that my father came to England as a 10-year-old boy from, a little Jewish boy from Nazi Germany on the kinder transport. At that time, and in fact until three weeks ago, I was under the impression that the only relatives I had on my father's side were family in Israel, um, some of whom I've been in touch with for the last 50 years. Completely out of the blue, three weeks ago, I had an email from a gentleman by the name of Pieter Navrocci, uh, uh, Pat. He's a professor of uh, computer science at Krakow University in Poland. And among many other documents that he sent me, he sent me a family tree uh, with probably 400 names on it, um, as well as going back to my great, 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 great grandparents in the 1700s. There are hundreds of contemporary members of the family. So I found out I have got cousins, many, many of them, in Poland, in Austria, in Belgium, in the United States, and in Ukraine. Because it's in Ukraine, they are varying in age between my age down to youngsters. Um, unfortunately, they all live in a town called Poltava, which is way to the east of the Dnieper River. Uh, so it's very much in the eastern part of Ukraine, so almost certainly uh, completely under Russian control now. Hence, you can see why Wendy and I have taken a more than average interest in what's happening in Ukraine, I'm sure we all do. Um, Wendy is part of a neighborhood group, and she picks up a lot of messages. And she picked up one yesterday from a lady in Shirley, um, who is um, obviously Ukrainian course is very close to her heart. She doesn't have a Ukrainian name. Um, anyway, uh, Wendy's been communicating with this lady last night and today and when he's also been doing a lot of research herself. And there are four ways that I feel we can support the people of Ukraine. Two of these, I'm afraid, are desperately short notice. Firstly, there is a candlelit vigil in Victoria Square, Birmingham, today at five o'clock. Um, sadly, Wendy and I can't go because we've got something else that we just can't get out of. Um, so Victoria Square, five o'clock tonight, a candlelit vigil. Um, we were also wondering where is the best place to uh, donate money if you wanted to. And again, when we did a lot of research on this, and the Ukrainian Institute in London has a, a website with dozens of possible places to make financial donations to. 
not just the huge organisations which may have the money in their bank for months, but organisations which will probably get money to where it's needed in a matter of days. If anyone is interested, come and see me, I will give you their contact details. The lady who put this post up that Wendy picked up, um, she is making a collection of various goods uh, to pack into a large van, which I'm sorry, it's tomorrow morning, it is leaving, driven by a couple of Polish people to the uh, Poland-Ukraine border. What they are wanting, and it would have to be got to her by tonight, uh, they are looking for duvets, blankets, pillows, clothes, shoes, nappies, sanitary products, sleeping bags, and bedding. Um, we have been rummaging through our cupboards and wardrobes, and it's surprising what is in there that we haven't worn for ages, that we haven't used for ages, and we feel that clothes that we haven't worn, duvets that we're not using, are going to do a lot more good to freezing Ukrainians on the Polish-Ukrainian border, or possibly even in Ukraine itself, than resting in the back of our cupboards. Again, if anyone feels that they have got things that they could donate or to go out this afternoon and buy, I will give you, come and see me, I'll give you this lady's contact address. She's in Shirley, Queen's Avenue in Shirley. If she's not in, she said her porch will be open to, to leave things. And fourthly, one last thing we can do, we can pray for the people of Ukraine. Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, the, yes. <coughs> Changing times, so keep it, we'll have to keep a close eye on that. Um, one last message, and um, it's to do with Roger, or rather Ruth. I gather she's going in for a hip operation shortly. Knee. Yeah. Knee. Thursday. Thursday, yes. right. Thursday on a knee operation. So keep Ruth in your thoughts. Keith, could I just mention the electoral roll revision is underway at the moment. Um, there's a list outside if you could check if you're on it that the details are correct or amend them otherwise. If you're not on the electoral roll, there's an application form out there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andrew. And if you'll um, bear with me following from uh, David's notice, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury and York have issued a pastoral letter which I ought to, to read to you uh, concerning the situation in Ukraine. Uh, Dear sisters and brothers, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. John 14, 27. Many of us will have troubled hearts as we watch with horror the attack by Russia on Ukraine. As we have already said, this attack is an act of evil, imperiling as it does the relative peace and security that Europe has enjoyed for so long. The attack by one nation on a free, democratic country has rightly provoked outrage, sanctions and condemnation. We lament with the people of Ukraine and we pray for the innocent, the frightened and those who have lost loved ones, homes and family. We continue to call for a ceasefire and the withdrawal of Russian forces, as well as wide-ranging efforts to ensure peace, stability and security. These events remind us powerfully that peace is precious and it is fragile. In chapter 14 of John's Gospel, Jesus speaks to his disciples at the Last Supper and he leaves them with his peace. This is not a mere greeting, but rather something deep and abiding. This peace is something that only Jesus gives, for it is a gratuitous gift, a way of living, something to be received for the gift of peace is the gift of Jesus himself. That is why the Lord is able to offer reassurance to our hearts, why those who receive the gift of the peace of Jesus Christ at the deepest of all levels should not be afraid. Peace, therefore, is so much more than the absence of war. It is a gift and it is also a decision, a gift that must be received. It is a choice that we make that shapes the way we live well alongside each other. It characterizes our relationships with God. It comes into being by seeking justice.
in these days of uncertainty and fear, we pray that each of us might again turn to the Lord and receive God's gift of peace, work for God's justice, know God's reconciliation and love, and choose paths not of hatred or destruction, of violence or retribution, but God's way of justice, mercy and peace. As Christians, our response to a crisis must always be rooted in prayer. And so we invite you to join with us in praying most earnestly for an outpouring of the Spirit of God that the world may once again choose peace, strengthening those international bodies that enable us to work and live together as one humanity inhabiting one world. We pray for those in Ukraine who suffer grievously, for all who take decisions around the world and for the people and leaders of Russia too. And in practical terms, we invite you to make this Sunday, 27th of February, a day of prayer for peace. On Tuesday, the 1st of March, at 6 p.m., to pray with the diocese in Europe for the chaplaincy in Kiev and the churches that serve Ukraine, and also to participate with the wider church in Pope Francis' call to make Ash Wednesday, the 2nd of March, a day of prayer and fasting for peace. However, and whenever you pray, pray that the world may choose peace and be assured of our prayers for you with every blessing, our archbishops. And so please stand now as we receive and go out with the peace of Christ. So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.